Oh my god, I actually did it. I actually finished all of the projects that I was working on in the last couple of weeks, the last month, probably. Man, I gotta tell you, first of all, I have to apologize, because I feel partially responsible for the fact that there hasn't been um, any new PCP this week, and how they've been kind of irregular lately, that there's been more of all the side projects than the main ones. No fault of Nate, who's been trying to organize PCPs all the time. Um, the rest of us are always busy. And, you know, Ben's been doing his Pokemon Sun, or his Pokemon, yeah, Pokemon Sun playthrough. Uh, and, um, and he's been busy working on his comic. So that's been keeping him occupied a lot. Devu has been working really hard on my videos. I, you know, gave him a lot of assignments. He, it took him a straight week to finish the, um, the video on uh, the, the one we just did, the Subverting Shonen Tropes video. And, um, I don't know, Jesse's been, I guess, just moping around somewhere <laughs> lately. I haven't seen a lot of him um, in the last month and a half or so. But, uh, but as for me, like, I'm usually, I usually see Nate's calls to action and I'm just like, I am busy working on all this other shit. I gave myself too much work. I gave myself too many projects, too many ongoing projects where I keep having, like, I'll, I'll be thinking, all right, today I'm going to edit this video, but then I'll remember, oh yeah, today is PCP day or today is pub crawl day or today is day I get called into random other podcasts. I did a podcast with Mumkey um, just like over a week ago. I did the Wave Motion Cannon podcast that I still that still isn't out. Um, I, I think it's going to come out soon. I hope it comes out soon because I'm giving it a shout out in my next video. Um, so yeah, there's just like a there's a lot of stuff that I've been that, that keeps pulling my attention aside and then I keep giving myself these really big projects and then having them stacked on top of all this other shit. And I was also saving a lot of stuff up. So like uh, the Let's Plays, you know, I stocked up the entire Bomberman and the entire Wario Land 4 Let's Play. Like, I didn't release any of it until both of them were pretty much completed. So, that was like 16 videos that were just sitting on my computer until I had time to edit all of them, upload them all, you know, schedule them all, give them all the information, um, which is a process in itself. Um, I had, uh, these fucking... God, I... So, so the, the two big ones that were really holding me, that were like weighing down on me, is the Coheating Cambria video and my audiobook of my, of my novel that I wrote six years ago. Both of these are pretty big projects that I kind of jumped on while the inspiration was there, and then quickly realized they were much too big. Now, I'm going to tell you about the, the best feeling in the world and the worst feeling in the world. The best feeling in the world is being way ahead of yourself. The best feeling in the world is when I have six completed videos waiting to be uploaded. That feels great. When there's six videos that that are that are already uploaded to which like, like like okay, let's say the let's plays, right? It feels great to know that in December there there will be a let's play video every month. I already scheduled a whole month worth of let's plays. You know, all of December, like the exact length of December because both Bomberman and Wario were 16 episodes apiece. Both their final episode will come out on the 31st. So every day of December has a has a Let's Play coming out. All of those videos are fully uploaded, fully scheduled. They have all their information in place, and the files have been moved to my hard drive, my, my external hard drive. They're not even on my computer anymore. Those videos are fucking done. That feels great. That's being ahead of yourself. The worst feeling in the world is having unfinished videos sitting around on the desktop and knowing that I haven't done them yet. And I have this, I like to have only one column of things on my desktop. I have four folders that are below my wrist. There's, you know, there's the computer, the computer icon, the, 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 the main user folder, the Digibro folder, the recycling bin, and then there's four folders under that. The first one is a music folder for all the music projects that I'm working on. The second one is just a general videos folder. It's it's called 
NNB, which stood for Non Non Biori, because I made the folder when I started up the Sitting Around Watching series with Non Non Biori. So whenever I take files off of my camera, I throw them into that folder, and then, you know, the files stay in there until those videos are done being edited, then I remove the files from the folder. Then there is the Podcasts folder, where I hold anything for this channel, pretty much, um, stays in that folder, and then finally, there is the Let's Play folder, which is new. I didn't have one in the old days, but I created one because of the Let's Plays I was doing with both Davu and Victor. These four folders, the best state for them to be in is empty. Now, a couple of them have materials, like for instance, the NNB folder has all of the comments that I use for the Board of Second Chances videos, or the podcasts one has the, you know, the thumbnail and the background uh, Photoshop documents for the Procrastinators videos, um, and the the music one just has a shit ton of of, uh, of errant music files in there, because I have a bunch of outstanding music projects, which is itself a problem, but I don't pay as much attention to that as I do the other stuff. But aside from those folders, I have, I have had this technique that I've been using the whole time I've been making videos. This is a, a, a very integral to my workflow, which is that because I'm so obsessed with my uh, desktop being clean, any video I'm currently not, uh, I'm currently working on that's not finished, if it doesn't go in one of those four folders, it goes right on the desktop. All the project files go straight on the desktop. And what that means is I can't get rid of them until I finish the project. So the Coheed and Cambria video had an audio, f like all, all the v videos of me talking into the camera were all in the NNB folder because I just ripped stuff from the camera straight to that folder. But all the project files for like the Coheed music videos and their songs and stuff and all that shit was sitting in a folder on the desktop called Coheed and I couldn't get rid of it uh, until I finished editing the video. Which took weeks. Because, <laughs> I'll, I'll get into why in a second. Um, then I did my audiobook and that had to sit on the desktop until I was done editing it. And this like, this this worms its way into my mind. Like, I need these things to be gone. And eventually, if something sits on the desktop for long enough and doesn't get finished, it will get thrown away. But I, I'm sure I've said this many times before, that for me, there is a, there's like a, there's a very steep, harsh curve of my interest level in completing a video. So there's the moment I get the idea for the video, which is a, a fairly high level of excitement. You know, depending on how how quickly I think I'm going to do the idea. If it's something that's like, a, you know, a vague idea that maybe I'm going to do in the future, but I'm not entirely sure, it's a, a low level of excitement. You know, I, I get a lot of those, like almost every day. There's some kind of idea that I'm like, oh, maybe I can do a video about that, but uh, I don't know exactly how it'd be. So we'll hold off on that for now. Then there's the ones that I am like I immediately know what it's gonna be, and I'm like, ooh, you know, like, oh, I'm ready to do that. You know, I could do that right now. Some of them are like, ah, oh, that would be a little bit too complicated. I'm not gonna do that today. You know, um, that oh, that requires me to watch ten shows. That one can get put off for a while. But if there's an idea that's like, ooh, I could do that right now, then it's you know gets pretty excited. Now, if I whether it's a like vlog and I'm getting in front of the camera, or if it's a written post, the act of creating it is the highest level excitement. If I'm writing a post, I am super into it, particularly like as I get close to the end. That's the highest level of interest I have in this project getting made is when I'm, you know, towards the back end of finishing writing it or when I'm recording the vlog. But after that, it goes straight downhill. Because if I have to start editing the video, I'm already past the part I was excited about, which was getting the idea out there, manifesting this idea into writing, and like, you know, making it concrete by putting it to paper. That's the exciting part. Now I just have to go through the process of making it presentable for an audience, which I'm not interested in. And the more I listen back to this audio, the more I hear myself talking about this thing, the less I care about the point I'm making, the stupider it sounds to me, the more I feel like, uh, was this even really worth it? You know, like, why did I even make this? That's how I start to feel as I edit. That's why Davu edits my videos for me. Because as that interest curve goes down, the likelihood of it getting done or it getting done well also goes down. And this is why a lot of my older videos reach that point where 
there might just be it might just be set to a video game like sword art online and analytical diatribe it's like i made this it's an hour long thing you know my interest curve peaked when i wrote that thing it was starting to go downhill after i had to record and edit the audio for that thing you know but it's still a pretty high level of excitement but then the prospect of editing an hour of video with relevant footage and then knowing that it probably wouldn't get onto YouTube, because at the time I didn't know how to get around YouTube systems. Total decimation of interest curve. Let's set it to video game footage, you know. Um, so I paid Davu because when he gets my videos, then he all at once hears the audio and immediately hits the top of that interest curve. And then he edits it, you know. He edits it while he's in that state and he's like, he stays there through the editing. And I do think it's, I, I think there's times where even he, if he has to edit something for too long, it, even for him, it becomes like a, okay, I don't care anymore, you know, by the time he's finished. There's some videos I feel like he, this Shonen one, I felt like fairly early into editing because it was so complicated because he had to gather so many fucking clips. I think he was starting to be like, I don't know why I'm editing this fucking video other than that I'm getting money, you know, like... But he can correct me if I'm wrong about that. But like, it was a, it was an arduous edit. You know, I could tell he 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 was a uh, he was not as stoked about doing it because of how arduous the process was. Um, so, because Davu's least favorite part of editing is having to just gather shit. Like he he's pretty good at the plug and play of actually editing it, but the gathering part um, seems to stress him out, and he had to do a lot of it for this. So, anyways, um, yeah, like. If I have to edit for too long, the likelihood of it being finished goes down. And this is especially true for anything that I don't see how this is like what the impact of this is going to be. Like if it's something I don't really care about, then it goes down further and further. So like, for instance, I got inspired when I was watching Shallow Rewards to make some music content, like to to make a a video explaining my history with a band because like a lot of his videos will talk about a band's entire history and I don't, I don't really have the the kind of knowledge that he does of like what goes on in the industry or like what was going on in the minds of the bands and their personalities but uh you know with a band like Coheed and Cambria I've heard all their albums a thousand million times I felt like I could talk with some confidence about how I feel their music has changed and maybe some of the reasons that it's changed but it's all very speculative and uh and and very gonzo and and uh and I just kind of did it unscripted and ranted and I ranted for like an hour and my idea with this video was I was going to edit in music clips to try and help prove my point that ended up being a lot more effort than I thought it would be and so this video that as I'm listening to it back all I can find like all I hear is all the things places where I use the same word a thousand fucking times I everything is just sweeping and epic and huge those are the three words and pathos I say all those words a, a million times um and and I just hear myself getting facts kind of wrong or just like not really explaining something in, a, in as much depth or like uh, certain places where I'm like, oh, why didn't I point this out? That would have helped. They're like, just all... Because it, it's an unscripted mess, you know? And I'm not really good at talking about music. And uh, and I was drunk and tired, probably. So, like, this is, this is something that should not have had to be edited for the amount of time that it did, you know? But it took a lot to edit it. And as I'm going, like, because I don't really have that much enthusiasm for it, it makes it harder and harder to keep working on it. So it sat on my desktop for, like, t two and a half, three weeks. You know, like, I was just slowly plugging away at it with little energy. And then I keep taking on all these other projects at the same time. So, like, this one is just sitting around while new shit keeps piling up. Oh, we did another Let's Play with me and Davu. Oh, we did another PCP. Now I gotta... And make sure that gets out and if that doesn't get out within a couple of days and the schedule's gonna get really fucking weird, you know, and like uh, It just becomes like a stack a fuck shit stack all on my desktop and uh, So God, let me take a breath for a second and these the decompression chambers don't help either because I've been trying to keep these to a week, like a relatively weekly thing. And I think I said on the last one that it, that it might be longer or whatever uh, before this one came out. But like, you know, when that week, when it starts getting towards the end of the week and it's like, oh, well, now I'm going to do a decompression chamber. Well, that pushes, like, if I have to edit this, then I'm not editing the Coheed video, you know. 
And then I stacked on top of the Coheed video an even worse edit project, which was the audiobook. And I'm, I'm glad I did it. I'm actually very glad that I made this audiobook. I'm really happy with how it's come out and the fact that it, it's out there, by the way. Um, I'm not making a video about it, but it's on my Reddit, on the rdigibro subreddit. Um, I might put a link to it in the description. If not, go find it. Um, it's called Tales from the End of the World, Book 1, Scarlet City. It's a four-hour audiobook, uh, and there's also like an hour and a half worth of podcasts I did about it afterwards. Check that out if you're interested. Um, I don't really want it to be widely released, but I do want to like sort of word of mouth spread it to make sure at least some of my fans get to read it. Uh, a few people have checked it out and their reactions were fairly positive. So, uh, so far it seems to be a good time and it's not that much of a time investment. It's only four hours even for the audiobook. Um, so, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy with how it came out, but the editing process was such a fucking nightmare because it was like I got inspired to do this all at once and I just recorded I just like sat down and in one sitting recorded the entire thing I just sat there for four hours and recorded an audiobook and then I had four hours worth of audio that I now had to edit which meant removing every stutter and fuck up and every like uh, and tightening up spacing that was the worst part is that like you know I wanted to make sure it flows well because if it flows like garbage then it's just gonna be even worse of an experience but it's not a good book it's not work I'm proud of it's I mean I I'm proud of it but like it's a six-year-old novel that that I never edited or revised at all and like it has tons and tons of glaring problems that I'm well aware of and so as I'm editing it I just keep hearing lines that I'm like oh god am I really editing this am I really trying to make presentable what is by all accounts a not very good book that I know is not very good uh, I just want it to exist and I'm not even releasing it widely I'm just releasing it to like an audience of probably 15 people on reddit you know, like, why am I putting so much effort into this? And because it's such a huge project, then even when I did, like, pluck away at it a little bit, you know, over the course of a couple days, it, it's just, it's so long that, like, I'm gonna have to put it on hold to go do the pub crawl or to go do something else. So, yeah, it was a nightmare to have this fucking four-hour-long burden over my head. And I finally defeated it with the, 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 the masterful technique that Dick Masterson came up with of the three beers. I gotta tell you about the magic of the three beers. You see, I've always known and I've, I've preached that editing is easier if you're a little drunk, like a little, at least a little tipsy, you know, have a beer or two while you edit because it, it helps to numb the part of you that doesn't want to do it. Like you, you still have enough cognitive ability to do the job because it's not hard editing is not like I don't think editing takes a ton of thought like you you can pretty easily figure out what you want and it, and it's rare that you come across something that's like hard to do or that's like something new that you haven't done before usually you know what you're doing and so it's just a matter of plugging and playing like hitting you know okay this is the I need to find this clip for this line I need to find this moment I need to time it right you know and all that can be pretty easily done without needing like a like you know your full brain which your full brain is tr just desperately trying to rip itself away from this and do anything else it just wants something to stimulate it and to not pay attention to this editing it wants to go to Twitter it wants to go anywhere else but when you numb that part, when you numb your brain just a little bit so that it can deal with doing something boring and menial for hours on end, editing is way easier. And I've always known this, but Dick Masterson came up with a formula for it, like a revelation. I mean, this man's been a lifelong alcoholic, so he's in his, in his late 30s. He, he truly has had time to perfect this technique. But he said, three beers. He said, you know how I got through all my emails finally? Three beers. You know how I deal, like any situation that you need to, that you're like, ah, I don't really want to do this, but I, I need it to get done. Three beers. Two beers, not quite enough. You know, the, well, the, 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 I, he said, you know, drink three beers. I think you can drink three in the process. Like for me, I usually start after like half of one beer. That's enough to get my mind sort of in the game, to prep myself that like, all right, Let's numb it a little bit and get it in there, you know. 
Um, but the third, you can't go above three. That's the important part. If you break over three, you're gonna get drunk and you're gonna get your that's when you get dumb that's when you get too dumb to actually do the thing you're trying to do but three beers it has to be light beers or like relatively you know not you can't drink a strong ass beer and think that three is gonna keep you under you know but you drink three r relatively normal beers and you'll be good and it's worked wonders for me to the point that I'm now becoming an alcoholic <laughs> but I, I drank three beers and made it through the entire rest of the editing and finally put that fucking chapter behind me. All the let's plays are up. All the that four hour fucking Q&A thing I did out of nowhere. Thank God I was able to edit that quickly. You know, like, because that's, that's the thing. I've got, oh, I'm working on this audiobook. Hmm, maybe I'll do a 50k sub special. Oops, it's four hours long, you know. <sighs> What am I going to do about this, you know? So, yeah. I knocked it all out. I got all of it done. And now I can start fresh. And I, This isn't to say that every single project that I have is, is that I have open is complete, you know? And I closed off a couple. I closed the finisher fail. Uh, not, not finisher fail. I closed off, um, what's it called? Um, the set board of second chances. And I closed off random ass recommendations, which I don't know that anybody was like holding me to that anyways, because it had been like two months since I did the first one. Um, but I closed those off because they were kind of overkill, and I, c I can open them up later. But I was like, I need, I need cer there's certain series that I want to start on that need to get started, and those ones are getting in the way. So. What's great about having like a clean slate of finishing all the old work is that I can like really focus on okay now these projects that I want to get started I can start on those you know so there's a few there's some the mu I have a few musical projects that I have a bunch of musical projects that are unfinished those ones though can kind of wait I'm not in any huge rush to finish my musical projects because they're always kind of in a there's kind of a different mindset I approach those with where like when I make music it's like getting inspired specifically in the moment to work on it it's not something I view as like a project I'm continually working on my music you know it, it's completely non-monetary and has nothing to do with the rest of my career it's really just something I do for fun when I feel like it so my, my musical projects notwithstanding there's only one no two videos that I have footage for that are incomplete one of them is the start of the, the new version of Finish or Fail. Um, and the other one is just this clip I took of a magazine thing that I haven't quite decided what I'm going to do with or if I'm going to do it. I just have the clip around. Um, but all the podcasts are clear until now. Now we've got this one, but that's okay because, you know, there's nothing else there keeping me from it. It's a, these are easy to edit. They're not a big deal. Um, and all the Let's Plays are done, so I can start up a new Let's Play show. I've got an idea for a new show I want to do that I'm like, that I, that, like, this is one of those things where I got an inspiration the other night. Like, I, I had an idea for a show that I suddenly was like, oh man, that's a really cool idea. I'm not going to record anything for it because I, if I do it, it's just this audiobook's never going to get done. This Coheed video is never going to get done. I just have to muscle through these fucking videos, these shitty idiotic videos that I should never have taken on. I just have to muscle through them. I want to, I want to become someone who finishes what I start. I, I never have been that guy. It's always been a huge problem for me. It's always been so hard and like, I really felt like I got started on that road with the asterisk war sucks. Like that was the, f like, and it was very important to me that, uh, that most of it was written before any of it came out. Like, you know, I wrote, I think, I think there were seven part, no, there must have been at least four or five parts written before I sent any to Devu. And I know there were eight parts written when the first part came out. And then, um... And then, like, from there, I continued writing it until the end of the year, you know. And 
Yeah, like it was it had to be so far along that there that there was no way I'd stop. Like that's the only way I could feel comfortable letting it start to come out because I'm always so worried that anything I launch is not going to finish because that's how it's been in the past. If you were a follower of my anime blog, which I don't know if anyone who listens to this was, I launched so many projects and they're always big. It would always be some huge thing like, oh, I'm going to review every single one of my favorite anime. I'm going to review everything on my on hold list, all 100 shows. I'm going to randomize them out of a hat. Oh, I built a randomizer of show like a there was one one randomizer I had was I wrote the like different years down on scraps of paper, put them all in a hat, shuffled it, picked out a year, and then I had to watch whatever show was on my on hold list from that year. Now that I'm thinking about it, this is actually a great idea and I should do it again because I only ever did one video of it before uh, and it would be better than random ass recommendations. <laughs> Not one video, one text post I mean. Um, you know, I had uh, like this awards show, like, oh, anime awards. The, 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 I'll give an award for each thing that, that like the best show in that category. I think I wrote three of those and then gave up on it, like out of the 20 rewards I was supposed to give. It's just a uh, lots of episodic stuff. I'm gonna blog every episode of Utena. I got through three. You know, I'm gonna blog every episode of Lane. I got through six. And you know, when I started doing anime videos, like that was one of my first goals was let's be someone who finishes projects. And that's why I did Lane first. It was like the out of all the projects I had left unfinished on my blog, that was the one I most wanted to finish, and so I did it. I, I mean, I completely redid it from the ground up, but it was the same concept, and I fucking... And it almost didn't happen. Like, after the first four, I started doing, like, other videos, and, like, they got slotted in. There was, like, these little vlogs that came out. I started concentrating on other stuff, and I started to feel like, eh, the, the lane videos aren't as... Like, they're not coming out as great as I wanted them to, but whatever. It got done. That was what mattered, you know, and, um, and, you know, I've completed a bunch of projects since then. I don't, I don't know that I've had any projects that had, like, a definitive amount that was supposed to happen that have stopped. Like, people keep asking me, like, when are you going to do episode two of interesting anime protagonists? And, like, the thing is, I never had much of a plan for that. Like, I really had exactly two ideas one of which I wasn't even that excited about I mostly just wanted to make that one video and I thought that no one would click on it if it was called like you know like stoic anime characters or whatever like or or, or like if I tried to give a name to that phenomena then nobody would click on it but if it was just called interesting anime protagonists and then it was suggested that this was just one type of interesting anime protagonist then people would click on it but i've never actually had a plan for how to continue that series really um and i still only have one other episode idea but um but stuff like cool character designs have kept coming out now you know um I st there's a few that i need to do more of but none of them were that like rigidly defined whereas there's stuff like there have been video projects that have just died because I didn't get it edited in time. You know, where like, I eventually lost interest in the concept or just thought, oh, this, this project's too big, I can't actually finish it, you know. I want to become a guy who finishes things. And I've got one really massive project that I'm kind of at the advent of, like that I'm, I'm a, a bit into, you already know what I'm talking about. Like, I guess I should also become someone who can finish videos I've spoken about because this has been a huge fear of mine because it used to be that anytime I talked about a project, it wouldn't get done. Um, this is especially true in the pony days. Every time I had a big video I would talk about, it would never get made. Um, and so I've been like terrified of that ever since. But like right now, the big project that I have is the sh the the Shaft one, you know. And I wrote Akiyuki Shinbo in the early 2000s, which is like the lead-in to dissecting Shaft, which is supposed to be like a 16-part series about all the Shaft shows. And you know, I'm gonna have to start on that at some point. But like, I want to become the guy who can finish that, even though I've talked about it, even though it's a huge, daunting task. I want it to exist, and I need to do it. I need to become the person who can do that. And, um, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm getting there, you know. I've got another cool little idea, the one I talked about earlier, which now I get to do it. Like, I had this great idea for a video, and I said, I'm not going to do this until 
I edit the rest of the audiobook and until I finish the Coheed video. And I did. And it also was like a test of, you know, because another fear I have, the reason I launch into projects on top of each other so quickly is because I'm always scared that if I put it off, I'll lose interest. You know, I don't want the, I want to get these things out there while they're fresh. But like, now I've had a couple days and it's like, yeah, this is still a good idea for a video. I should still do it. You know, fuck it. Let's fucking launch this video idea. It'll be cool. We'll see what happens. We'll see where it goes. It may or may not become a series. We'll find out. Um... But yeah, so that's that's where I'm at today. I'm at, I finally finished all my outstanding projects. Uh, I could probably by the time this podcast comes out, because I think I've been recording for about thirty minutes, so this will probably be a couple days late because I'll have to have more things to talk about before this gets published. But um, by the time this is out, maybe I'll have. The, those last videos I mentioned that are that are like you know that I that just kind of have the early workings maybe those will be out too maybe even the cool idea I'm hinting at maybe you'll already know about it um, so yeah well, I'll see you then and uh, and also in the next part <laughs> I don't know I'm very tired and kind of delirious uh, from editing this fucking Coheed video all night um, so yeah whatever So here's a first for this uh, podcast. I actually just listened back to the previous part before recording this part just to make sure I wasn't going to repeat myself too much or to remind myself exactly how I presented these concepts that I was talking about. Not not usually something I do. I usually listen to these um, after I've uploaded them, um, not even really during the editing process. But, um... I, I wanted to expand on some of those things I said and uh, readdress some of it because now that I've you know I, now I've done more projects I with that liberation I felt from having all my projects finished I then immediately launched into more projects and it was interesting I kept them because of that pileup I just experienced I put a lot of um, I, re I really wanted e these to each be done before the next one started. Like, I kind of slotted them one after another. So, after the Coheed video, I did that Hamtaro one, the Handfuls of Zen, which may be a series. I don't know how long of a series it'll be, or how frequent it'll be, but um, I'm excited at the idea of it. It's Basically, the idea is that it's a Game Boy Advance show. and Because um, Game Boy Advance is kind of... I, I see it as a console I'm the most connected to. It, it's it's like games that are... I don't want to say it's like my favorite console or anything, or even that it has a lot of my favorite games. It's just that the games are very well suited to my interests in terms of I really love the graphical style. Um, they tend to be simplistic and short, which is helpful for me. And I've played a lot of them. Like, the era that I played the most video games was probably the Game Boy Advance era in my childhood. So, like, I'm, I'm very familiar with the console and with, like, all the classics. You know, a lot of consoles I had, but I didn't have the classics that everyone remembers. And I, I did for the GBA, uh, as well as some more obscure games. And I have an interest in obscure ones. So, um... So I thought it would be neat to do a Game Boy Advance show. But I don't want it to be, like... I just wanted it to be as not obvious or or something that it, that I'm like beholden to as possible. I wanted it to have a title that doesn't really say this is about the Game Boy Advance. You know, like handfuls of zen, once you get it, you're like, "Oh, okay, cuz it's a handheld console." Um and also the episode numbers. I didn't want there to be numbered episodes cuz there's something that holds you when you have like episode 1 and then episode 2 then you suddenly feel like this has to reach a certain number. Like, there has to be a certain number of these, and they have to come out at a certain rate. Like, because when you think episode, you think weekly. You know, you think, oh, well, yeah, episode one, so episode two comes out next week, or even monthly, um, as a lot of uploaders are, you know, more infrequent. At least this is how I think. I don't know if anyone else thinks this way, but, like, I, I go... I usually go way out of my way to avoid episode numbers unless it's a series that I really don't care about that much. Like most of my uh, my finish or fail style things, the ones where it's like me just sitting around watching something and I'll give it like, you know, spin the crunchy roulette number five because why? there's nothing else to distinguish it. Like I'm not going to list every show that we watch in the title. So it's just a way to distinguish that it's not the same one you already watched, sort of. 
Um, but I don't really care about if those series, you know, reach a certain number of episodes because they're kind of like a like a joke anyways in the first place, um, or they're, uh, just for fun anyways. So with ha with handfuls of Zen, rather than giving it an episode title, the number is just the number of the game because every Game Boy Advance game has a number for some reason. They all have a number between zero 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 one and two eight one zero, I believe, in in order. So yeah, they're all numbered. Not sure why, but I've just posted the number as the episode number, and I thought that was a really fun and cryptic way to do it. Um, I've been pretty inspired. There's one video by Shallow Rewards that was that really wormed its way into my mind and, and really interested me on a deep level because it's something I'd never completely thought about, which was about people hiding their work, about deliberately making things that aren't meant for mass consumption, that are meant for just the people who would care about it to see it. And I feel like... It's something I've always been interested in, and I've I've made lots of like alternate blogs and alternate sites that I don't connect to myself in the past. Not so much anymore. These days, I really want my core fans to be able to find a lot of my stuff, but I don't I don't necessarily want all of it to be like widely distributed. You know, I really do want it to just be those core fans. Um, you know, back in the anime blogging days, I had my main blog, which when it was first made was called Digital Boys Anime Blogging. Then its name got changed to Euphoric Field after I watched F A Tale of Memories. Then it got changed to Fuzakenna once I bought a domain. And then it got changed to My Sword is Unbelievably Dull once I got rid of the domain and went back to just being a, a WordPress blogger. Yeah, quite a trajectory. But in the meantime, I also had side blogs, some of which I was like posting just completely other alternative stuff that just wasn't in the same style as the main blog. Not that the main blog had a very defined style, but for instance, at one point my blog was on hiatus and I deliberately decided to put it on a three month hiatus. Like I even said at the beginning, like this is how long I'm going on hiatus for. And I took a break from anime pretty much entirely, but I got really into manga. And so I just cr kind of created this entire other persona who was a manga guy. And his blog was called Is That You Motiliata, which is a, a line from, um, from a Mars Volta song called This Apparatus Must Be Unearthed. Uh, and the, the tagline of the blog was This Manga Must Be Unearthed. You can still find the site, is that you motiliata.wordpress.com. Good luck spelling that, unless you look up the Mars Volta lyric. Um, but the, the, the writer was named Se Dice Bisonte, which means Is This a Bison, um, which is from, or This Is a Bison, rather. Yeah, This Is a Bison, Not a Buffalo is the name of the album by uh, Omar Rodriguez Lopez, who's the guitarist of the Mars Volta. So everything's kind of themed around the Mars Volta and Omar on the, uh, in the titling of this, of this character and site. But on this website, I was just writing about manga in, but in like a character that wasn't like me. It was a much more like polite and upstanding figure because my blog was always extremely crass and in your face and there was swearing constantly and perverted humor and stuff and like I, I just, I always had this very in your face personality. And I thought that if I tried to write in another style, if I tried to like bring in a series that wasn't quite the same, then People would just, I mean, everyone knows it's me, so they wouldn't really see it as, like, another person. they just see it as me doing a weird affectation that is clearly not how I normally write. And that was what I was concerned about. So I made an entire new, entirely new site, new blogger, you know, I got it, there's this, I don't know that it had, like, any readers I had a few comments here and there because there's this anime blog aggregator that that people used to use back in the day called anime nano and you would try to get your if you had like a decent number of posts you could get onto anime nano and it would just post your stuff up there and you could get some clicks that way it was a decent way to get a little head start um so i had i had gotten onto anime nano and i think i had a couple readers but I really was just doing it for myself. Like, I was just blogging manga in this very in-depth and interesting way. The The posts were all, like, medium length. It was always, like, probably between 500 and 1,000 words. Not very long. Um, but they would break down the artwork in manga. And it was written in this very polite, 
normal tone that was nothing like me at all. Um, and yeah, it was just a matter of like, I didn't want this to be the same crowd as my main blog. I just wanted it to stand on its own. And if, you know, whoever took an interest in it would take an interest in it, regardless of it being something I made. Now, eventually I gave up on the blog. It only lasted probably like mostly it was only active during the time I was on hiatus on the main blog. And then I posted like a couple more times there. And then eventually I imported all those posts back onto the main blog. So they are still, they're all on my blog and on the original. Um, and I've had a, you know, I've had other times where I, I kind of compartmentalize things differently and split things into different places. And I still do it, obviously, with Digibro versus Digibro After Dark versus um, this channel versus my Reddit board. You know, everything has its own place. And this idea of deliberately, like, I guess it never occurred to me. Like, with that manga site, it wasn't like I was trying to not let it get popular. I still would have liked it to be popular. I just didn't want it to be associated with the same writing style as my as my main blog. And I'm sure eventually I would have revealed that it was the same guy or something. Um, or if the other blog got more popular, I would have probably jumped ship and just become that guy. But, but like, making something and then hiding it. Like not wanting it to get popular, like putting it somewhere where I don't want, I, I, I'm, I'm putting it somewhere that only people I want to see it will see it. That was something I hadn't given too much thought to, but it makes perfect sense to me because so much, there's so much stuff that, that like, you know, I don't want everyone seeing certain things like, and this is the case for my audiobook, which you know, this this podcast right here only has 5,000 listeners, which to some people would seem like a lot, and to me seems like not very much, because it's, you know, paltry compared to my other channels. But those 5,000 listeners, the kind of things they're listening to on this show, they're the kind of people who can appreciate this book, who I'm okay with hearing it, you know, or the people who are on my Reddit board, that's where I released it, is on Reddit. You know, um, I'll probably link it to my patrons at the end of the month post I'm gonna do. Uh, those are people I can let the story be heard by because again this is a very odd story that was a portrait of who I was when I was 19 it's not me currently you know and yet it is it like there's a lot of me in it and you can still tell I wrote it but um but you know it, it's not polished it's not something that was made consumer ready I recorded the audiobook just so that it would get out there even though the book itself was never finished you know it's got missing chapters it's got uh plot holes it's got just stuff i would completely change as you can hear detailed in my podcasts so yeah i decided to hide it i decided not to put it on digibro after dark because i don't want to read comments about what's wrong with this book because i know what's wrong with this book it was written nine years ago and never edited i know exactly what's wrong with it you know i have no desire for it to get out there and try to have a life of its own and increasingly, I don't know how much I want a lot of things to do that, you know? For me, like, a, a post on Digibro is one that I'm trying to, like, there, there's a reason that so many of the videos that go up on Digibro are about, like, trying to change the public conversation. Like, Digibro is almost like a, uh, like a rallying cry channel. Like, every video I post is, like, me trying to affect the way that the masses talk about anime, to some extent, you know? It's, it's, it's maybe a little pretentious, even, but, like, there's always that tone of, hey, I wish you all would, would talk about it this way, you know? Uh, hey, why don't we stop talking about subversions because it doesn't fucking mean what you think it means and it's obnoxious and it just shows that you haven't read enough shonen manga. You know, like, that's the tone of that video. Um, so those things should be out there. Those things are meant for the masses. They're meant for me to, they're, they're, they're me trying to change the cultural tide. But not every, not every little thought I have, not every little, like, this podcast is not meant for the masses. This podcast is meant for whoever it would interest. And I've always had this mindset that you have to cast a wide net in order to catch, uh, you know, the fish you want, right? Like, let's say that there are 5,000 people out there who would enjoy my audiobook. And if I only cast a net around 5,000 people and 50% of those turn out to not be people who would like my audiobook, 
then, you know, I'm only getting half of what I could be getting. So if I cast a net that's 10 times wider, maybe I'll catch all 5,000 of those people. But I'm also going to catch a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't, that doesn't care. You know, a whole bunch of people who don't care or who actively dislike it. And, like... Because I've always had that mindset of like I, I want everyone who could possibly interested in be interested in this thing to see it Then I've never taken a step back and gone like well, I mean In the end people are gonna miss out on stuff. They would enjoy. That's just a fact of life There's too much shit out there that you would enjoy and for me as someone who collects recommendation charts like as a fucking hobby I know this all too well. I have like hundreds of of books and movies and video games and comics that I'm never gonna get to even though I'm sure I'd like them but like you know unless unless the fucking singularity happens and I get my life extended by a hundred years I'm not catching up on all this stuff and I shouldn't be necessarily trying to catch every single person because I don't really need them like I'm, I, I would like it if everyone who would like my stuff would see it, but I don't need everybody who does so to do so. Like, I can be satisfied with a couple thousand views and like a hundred comments on a video. That's like a great amount. You know, if I can make a video like, uh, like this mindless self-indulgence one I just put out, you know, and it's a, a concept I've had for years. I mean, I even taught, I, I did this whole spiel in a, in a Halo Let's Play once, but no one watches the Halo Let's Plays, you know, no one watches the, uh, the Digi and Friends Let's Plays. Um, so, like, that whole spiel, yeah, even though I'd done it before, a lot of people hadn't heard it, and I wanted to make it its own, like, nice, glossied up video. And I will say, I'm glad I did the Coheed one just for the experience of figuring out how it would look, like how a, me talking about music would come out if I tried to throw in clips and stuff. Because the, the MSI video was a breeze to edit. I legit recorded it and then edited it all in one sitting. It was like maybe three hours, four hours from concept to completion. And uh, that's rare. You know, for for something that that's that's that heavy on editing, for me to just like immediately grind it all out, but it was because I was excited about it, because I thought I made my point well. There wasn't a whole fuckload of factual inaccuracies or weird shit. It wasn't an hour and a half long. You know, it was exactly what I wanted it to be, concise and and well made. And I did it, and I was like, yeah, that Coheed video gave me the experience to figure out how this would work, and it worked really well. Um, and just seeing, you know, a handful of comments that are like either wow i've liked this band forever and i didn't know this stuff that's cool or man you really got me interested in this band that i'd never heard of before or like uh that's an interesting take on the con like just a few comments like that is enough i don't need it to be like seen by everybody i don't need it to have a hundred thousand views that would be nice for making money but i have a channel for making money you know the digibro channel is for making money the patreon my, you know, a, a lot of the people on Patreon are people who watch, like, all my stuff, and they're paying for just me existing, essentially, you know? I only really need the core audience, the ones who are, the, the Patreon, the Patreon people are the people I really need, you know? I, I still make, by far, most of my money on Patreon, not so much through ad revenue, because I don't go out of my way to make all my videos super monetizable. And it's funny, because I could do it. I'm, like, I feel like I was born and bred as the perfect YouTuber, in a way, because, uh, there's this recent Game Theory video about YouTube's changes that they've been implementing, that, like, everyone's been freaking out, because YouTube's been changing their algorithms and stuff, and Game Theory did a video that, like, explained it in concrete terms and kind of put a lot of the rumors to rest, well, at least, you know, attempts to. But basically, the way that YouTube is working right now is that they're not only rewarding retention time, which is something we've known about for a couple years, that YouTube re rewards you for the length of time that people watch your videos, but now they're also rewarding you for coming back every day. Now, I'm somebody who puts out hours of content every single day. I'm perfectly primed for this, you know? But the funny thing is that I almost release them in a way I wouldn't say deliberately, but the way I release videos does not optimize on this ability. If I had everything on one channel, like just said fuck it to all these weird divisions and all this like all this like concept of how I want these things to be released, and I just put it all on one channel and released it all at the rate I do, I think it would actually like balloon in success. I think that 
like if if all of this was just on Digibro, everything I do was just on Digibro, I think it would actually maybe not everything, you know, keep out the rap videos and all that weird shit that can stay on after dark. But if a lot of these vlogs I've been doing were up there, a lot of these uh, podcasts, I think it would become more successful and uh, and make me more money through ad revenue. But there's also sacrifices in doing that because. All those big YouTubers who are concerned about this, they're the people who make their money mostly through ad revenue. Like, the only reason to be worried about YouTube changing its ad revenue rules is if you make money through it. I don't really worry about ad revenue. I don't even check it. Like, I get the money in the mail once a month, and then I'm just like, oh, oh, I guess I made money through ads this month. You know, like, I don't even think about it at all because I really just worry about the Patreon. I really just worry about the the fan payments because that's not only is it the biggest source of income, but that's, those are the people I care about. You know, I care about the idea that I'm making something people want to pay for more so than that I'm making something that will make money. And what those people lose out on, all those big YouTubers, is their comment sections are garbage. You can't get any real feedback. You know, you've got way too many people vying for your attention. The whole internet becomes hard to deal with. I've, I've been there, I've been in that position, like, even though I was not as famous, like, when I was big in the brony click, it was really, like, like, I couldn't talk to any, any bronies, unless they were other video creators, because they, they see you as, like, this celebrity guy, it, it's a little bit this way in anime, too, like, if I head out, if I were to head to some forum somewhere, or, like, just talk to people casually on the internet, they'd, they'd come in with a huge amount of presupposition about me, because, they see, the funny thing is that the people who are really into my work, I don't think see me as much of a celebrity. Like you guys, anyone listening to this podcast, you probably see me less as a celebrity than people who barely know me. People who only know me as like a guy with 250,000 subscribers and they've seen like maybe one or two of my videos, they see me as like this, whoa, it's Digibro, that famous anime YouTuber. You know, when, when I did the Wave Motion Cannon podcast, like, the guy was like, uh, Josh, he was like shocked. He was like, wow, I'm actually talking to you. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm a guy who reads anime blogs. I'm an anime blogger. I, of course you're talking to me. Why? Like, I, I read your fucking website. I read everyone's website, you know. Um, that's the kind. That's how I feel about it. And I feel like the people who engage with my content, who know that you can find me in the comments, you can find me on my Reddit, you can find me on my Patreon, you know? I don't respond to everything, but you know I'm there. You know I'm not some, like, untouchable celebrity off somewhere who doesn't, you know, even, like, have the time to engage with fans, even though I don't read the comments on the main channel anymore, but that's exactly the issue. That channel's too big. I can't read the comments on it anymore. When a video gets over 100,000 views, you can pretty much say goodbye to nuanced discussion in the comments. And don't get me wrong, I still get lots of great comments on there. In fact, I'd say more so than bad ones. It's just that people have less context. The more a, the more a video gets big, the more people are watching it who don't know me. And the people listening to this show or listening to the, the, the After Dark show, they know a lot about me. They have a lot more context. They know kind of what I'm about, what kind of comments I'll respond to, you know, like what kind of discussions I want to have on the internet. Uh, a lot more so than people who come in for just one video and and are lacking in that context and um, and that's something I value I like having a dialogue with my audience I to me it's always been about the depth at which someone appreciates something not so much how many people appreciate it you know I don't I, that's why I'm not a like a pop guy I, I, I'm always I'm boogie pop I've said this a thousand times that like pop is all about appealing to a lot of people a little bit whereas boogie pop is about appealing to a smaller number of people a lot and uh and that's what i hope that i do and you know i know from my fans that i do and it so it's it's really great for me that i was able to put out this novel that i wrote six years ago and um and a few people listened to it i didn't even i didn't expect like, the most I expected to listen to this is, like, at the absolute most, even after this podcast, even after all the, any time I mention this book, because I'm going to mention it probably a few times, you know, I'm going to mention it here, maybe I'll mention it here or there on After Dark, and I'll definitely mention it on Patreon, the absolute most people I expect to ever listen to this book is, like, maybe 30, and that's including my offline friends, you know, Victor has already listened to it, um, Ben and Devu probably will at some point, so, so yeah, like, I... I don't expect a lot of people to listen to it, but 
The second I had like two opinions about it, I was satisfied. Like it was all worth it. As soon as like I was able to have a conversation with Victor about my book that I wrote all these years ago that I've never stopped thinking about, you know, I got to have a conversation about it. I get to see, I get to read people's reactions to this book. I don't care, you know, how many people see it. I don't care how many, like how deep these reactions are. I just wanted there to be some reaction. I just wanted to know, does anyone like this? Does anyone care about this? Is this interesting at least? You know, and, and the responses have pretty much been, yeah, it was pretty interesting. Or, yeah, I kind of liked it. You know, like, that, that's basically what all the response has been. There's been, like, five or six people who've commented on it on Reddit. And, uh, and that's enough. That, that's enough to make it completely worthwhile. And maybe there's going to be more stuff that I kind of hide a little bit. And Handfuls of Zen, to bring this back, because I'm sure you forgot that this is what I brought this up for, is, like, a pseudo-hidden video. Because it's not the Game Boy Advance show. It's not a review of Ham Ham Heartbreak. You know, it is Handfuls of Zen. It's on the Digibro After Dark channel. The people who are going to watch that video are mostly going to be my fans. I don't want it to be, I don't want it to escape into the hands of video game fans. And I mean, if I have one, let's say I cover like the most popular GBA game, you know, and I have nice things to say about it. And, and some, some new people come in and most of them will probably just react to that video, but maybe a few of them will become fans of the show and watch the other stuff and find it interesting. That's great. You know, I love getting new people on board, but what I don't want is that I put out a video called Castlevania Aria of Sorrow Review and I make some negative comments about it and then I get a bunch of people showing up to complain. Funnily enough, the Coheed and Cambria video it has some of that. Like, not so much in the comments, but I it, some Coheed and Cambria fan Twitter, like it was like hashtag all things Coheed, I think was the name of it, something like that. They posted it up and they were like, uh, see how far you can make it into this video before closing and they tagged me in this post. And then of course, all these responses come in, I didn't even make it 30 seconds. Oh, this guy seems like a total asshole. Like people who literally know nothing about me, who know nothing about what the video is supposed to be or the context surrounding it. They just clicked on a Coheed video, they interpreted it as negative, and they freaked out. That's why I have to hide some things, you know? And that video is not even like made to be super public. I mean, I did give it a, th a relevant thumbnail and title. So, but I even called it a fan's retrospective specifically so it wouldn't be taken that way. Like I, I originally was going to call it Coheed and Cambria what happened, but then I was like, that makes it sound too like, uh, like, like I'm trying to write a, an article or something like something more objective, if you will. Whereas if I put a fan's retrospective, it makes it more clear this is a personal story, you know? And I, and I try to, like, really, in the early part, I try to be really fair about the idea that, like, this, maybe the band's not even gone to shit, maybe it's just me, you know, I go, I go on a lot about that, but, you know, on some level, the video has to stay hidden, because the video is not for Coheed and Cambria fans. That's not who the audience was intended to be. It's just me telling a story about a band that I that I liked. You know, it's more about my narrative. It's more for my fans to just see something kind of fun and cool about some band that they maybe have heard of or maybe not. Um, so yeah, that's why like with this hand with this handfuls of Zen thing, it's 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 really about. It, it, I wanted it to be its own thing. It's not. The Game Boy Advance show. It's that video is not a Hamtaro video. It's my video that uses those elements, and I think that 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 is kind of what I get out of something like Shallow Rewards, where that show has a title, Shallow Rewards. You know, it's it's not just the name of the guy making it. Like it is a show unto itself. It has its own style, and none of the videos are just about the thing he's talking about. It's about his presentation of the thing he's talking about and the cult of personality that is his, you know, his writing. So that's kind of where I find the value in hiding things. And, um, and it's really a privilege I have because I have a main revenue stream. And I think there's a, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think there is somewhat right now a fetish is a fetish is fetishization. Is that the word? Yeah. Okay. It seems like it needs more syllables. There's currently a fetishization of working uh, like making money off of art 
like I think because there's more people who are able to do it online now than like everyone's chasing that and I don't think that used to be like a, as common of a thing I think it used to be that there were a lot more people who worked normal jobs and did art just because they enjoy it and that it was never meant to get big and you still see this like there's lots and lots of let's say like cover bands for instance if you ever go see like um, a few of Oh my god, probably close to a year ago, me and a couple of friends went with my mom to some bar where some 80s hair band cover band was playing. And it was just like like a bunch of 40 year old guys who get together every probably month or so and do a bunch of covers of hair metal songs because they want to and it's fun and they get to hang out with a bunch of people at a bar and get drunk and it's a good time. And I think that maybe everyone is trying to be like their own celebrity and to make like a whole career out of art now and they think that that's the only way to do art as opposed to just doing it on the side because you want to um which is a great way to get started and i mean if you think of my career in term in in like a full scale that's what it was for the longest time you know my anime blog was never intended to take off i wrote it for seven years before it got before it took off and um and now i'm I've been writing for over nine years, close to ten, if you, you know, count my, my anime blog as part of it, or my channel, rather. So, yeah, like, I feel like people need that kind of build-up time, and everyone's just trying to, like, launch a career out of art immediately out the gate. And some people are lucky, some people can do it. Some people manage to, to get that, um, either through having good connections or just being incredibly talented right when they start. But I think everyone else is looking at those people and trying to be them. And uh, I think that because I've been lucky enough that I had such a long time of buildup and then I did launch a career through art and because it manages to make enough money that I don't have to work at it constantly, I actually have time to do other projects that are just out of passion, that have nothing to do with making money, you know? Nothing on Digibra After Dark is ever made to make money, with the, like, one exception of the Ghost in the Shell video, because I thought it would be really funny to see if it could make 100,000 views, and it did. So, like, <laughs> nothing else on the channel is oriented around making money. The Procrastinators channel is not making me any money. You know, this, these videos, these decompression chambers, I can't, like, I monetize them, but they're on, they're not even on my channel. You know, it's connected to Nate's account. Um, Nate has said that he eventually wants to, like, split up all the PCP money amongst all of us once it's, like, actually made some money and he's collected it. But, like, you know, I'm, I'm basically just doing this for free. I mean, the most it would make was, would be $5 an episode for, for these uh, decompression chambers. But, like... You know, I'm not making any money off of this. I'm just doing it because I feel like it. I'm just doing it because it's something I want to do. Um, and I wrote the... I did the audiobook, you know, for an audience of... Uh, spent a week editing it for an audience of what will probably at most be 30, you know, 30 people. I, I'm doing all these things that are just... They're just for me. And, uh, and that really is a privilege because a lot of my friends are trying to become successful. You know, they're trying to make a job out of it. Um, even though some of them are just, I mean, because it's not a job yet, they're just doing it on the side for now, but like, it's because I make enough off of those videos that it doesn't have to be a full-time career. I don't have to be, I don't have to make it so I am getting out a 20 minute video every single day on a main channel just to make a buck, you know, which is what like th all those big YouTubers who are complaining now that like that YouTube's algorithm is not working out for them. You know, they only have to complain about that because of the fact that they have to make ad revenue dollars, you know, and I don't. I, I'm privileged to not have to do that. I get to have, um, you know, my own system that works for me because my fans are willing to pay for it. So, yeah, I'm lucky enough that I get to do whatever the hell I want, um, which is exactly what I always wanted my career to be. So, it's really beautiful for me. So, the other benefit of having released that audiobook is that I got to s spend a lot of time thinking about it and thinking about my writing, uh, my fiction writing that I used to do. Because for a very long time, that was my goal, was to be a fiction writer. And um, sort of what incited me to go and do that book. And let me know if you find this 
an interesting concept, which I know a bunch of people are going to say yes regardless because it's a, a video I suggested and I've never been like, hey, does anyone find this interesting and had nobody say yes because someone's always going to find everything interesting. But I had this idea that I would record a podcast just explaining all my old stories. Like, I was just going to go through one by one and find every old story I'd written, like, every concept I had, uh, and, like, half-written first chapters and stuff, and just, uh, explain all of them. And I thought this would be a fairly simple thing, but then I started going through all my notebooks, and I realized I have a shitload of stories that I was coming up with back then. Like, I mostly remember a handful of, like, the most, uh, you know, the ones I got the farthest with, and because it's been such a long time since I quit, it never occurred to me, like, just how many fucking ones I had. I found, like, one page that's called, like, Ongoing Projects, and there's 30 stories on that page. And then I, like, find all these other ones, you know, I'm just, like, going through these notebooks that have all these fucking character bios, all these little short synopses and stuff. Some of them are, like, the title of a story on a page, and, like, one line of description of what it would be. But other ones are, like, these whole fleshed-out universes and shit. And I was like, holy fuck, I had so many fucking ideas. Um, I spent so long trying to do this. And, um, you know, even after my novel, I wrote a few more things before I finally gave up on the whole novelist thing. But rereading the book really reminded me of like where my, actually I won't even say reminded, it taught me where my strengths lie as a writer. Because back then I, you know, I wasn't a professional, I wasn't as good as I am now, I wasn't as good of an analyst as I am now. You know, I can analyze my own work just as well as I can analyze anybody else's. Uh, but, you know, back then I was much younger, uh, wasn't as critical, didn't know as much about like what makes good storytelling or good writing. And now I can look back at that book and be like, huh. You know, I, I, I have kind of a knack for character writing and construction and, like, giving characters distinctive voices, um, and I have some pretty, pretty good dialogue. Some of it's corny as shit, but there's moments where the dialogue's really interesting, and I, I, I of course, could do it a lot better now because I have much better taste. Um, you know, there's a lot of potential there. Like, when you read through it, you really feel like, man, if this guy had kept writing... He'd be great. And that's, my brother explicitly said that. Victor listened to it and he was like, you know, it's not really bad at all. And he was like, if you had been writing fiction the way that you've been writing blog posts, like if you had kept doing it all this time, you would be as good at fiction as you are now at analysis. And I was like, yeah, that's true. Like I would, be, I would actually be great at fiction if I'd kept doing it this whole time. Um, I just didn't. And then, but it, it's, it's weird because... It's not like I haven't been writing, you know, like even though I'm writing in a different field, I feel like a lot of the skills I have from this can easily be reapplied to fiction. And like now that I've kind of analyzed my story and thought about like, huh, well, if I just did this, like if I cut out this element, like, you know, uh, I was never good at constructing like um, strong narratives. I was always good at like character interactions and more slice of lifey kind of stuff because that's more of what I was interested in at the time anyways. Um, I'm better at, like, constructing a scene that means something about a character, like the, the development kind of aspect, and not so good at creating a plot. And uh, for some reason, I was always stuck on the idea that I really needed a plot back then, even though so much of what I liked didn't really have a plot at all. But now I know how to write, like, much smaller stories, and not everything has to be, like, some big, deep sci-fi concept like it was in that book. And so, uh, I think I could do it a lot better. Like, I think I could take all the elements I was great at and, and construct something new. And so I'm just kind of looking at this book and looking at the reception it's getting, which has been all positive. I mean, it's only a handful of my closest fans who have read it, so it's not like I'm going to get these huge negative comments. But I was really shocked by how much, like, my brother Victor liked it, you know? Um, who, like, there's a lot of... There's a lot of stuff about this book that it would be easy to hate, and people didn't hate it as much as even I did. Like, I was really harsh on it when I first read it, and I recorded a podcast about it, and then I did a follow-up podcast where it kind of softened up because I'd had more time to think about it and been like, yeah, I guess it is kind of interesting now that I think about it. Um, and so all of that's kind of inspired me that I might get back into fiction. I'm st I've been coming up with more... Like, I, I, was tr I came up with a story concept I like. I'm going to maybe try to run with it and uh, see where that takes me and see if I can get back into fiction because I guess I was shocked by 
how not shit I was. I expected to be more shit, and I wasn't that shit, and I feel like I could improve, improve quickly, and I have plenty of time. Like, all it would take away from is probably time spent doing, I don't know, decompression chambers or something, or, or all these fucking podcasts. I mean, I have, even with the crazy amount of output I have, I still spend hours out of every day just kind of, like, laying around fucking staring at the ceiling, you know, um... So it's not like I am completely maximizing on my time, although I will say I've been working a fucking lot lately. Uh, definitely a lot more than I ever have before. These days I've been much more of a workaholic, but there's something... I guess this is how I'll end this, is by explaining this last thing. That, like, back in April, um, we had, me and Davu, we had finished the Asterisk War Sucks series in, like, January, February, that area. Um, and... The Patreon got high enough that I could start paying him full time, where it, like it became his job. He left his job and became just my editor because I was able to pay him enough to make it worth it, you know? And so when he first joined me as a full time editor, I wrote out a schedule for the month of April. I believe it was April. And it was five videos, I think. There was one and a half, I think, that I'd written before the month had started. Two of them were videos I'd conceptualized a long time before, and then the other ones were, like, new. It was interesting anime protagonists, uh, the How Hayao Miyazaki maps a setting, the, the one about Stray Little Devil... <sighs> what else was there? I think there were two more. Um, I think maybe What is the Appeal of Anime was that month. And I think there was one more, but... I had these five ideas. Oh, cool character designs Shimonetta. I think that's the last one. And, um, I, I, not all of them were fully written. I had a couple written. I sent those to him and then I was writing the rest over the course of the month, but it felt so good to have a plan because I'd never gone ahead with a plan like that. I've never had a full month planned ahead until that point. Um, I usually was like, you know, coming up with a concept, writing it, immediately making it, and then having to come up with another concept. I was very rarely working ahead of myself. So April was the first time ever that it was like, here's a whole schedule and we'll make it. Each video has a deadline for when it's going to come out. I have to have it written by a certain date and then you have to have it published by a certain date, you know, and we did it. We kept to the schedule the whole month perfectly. Um, the next month we did something similar. It was a more simplistic schedule because it was only four videos. It was just one a week. We got it done. And um, we didn't keep doing that every month because eventually... Uh, there was like a month where I only had one video, just didn't want to do any of these concepts I had, and then we did Radcon, and then Davu moved in, and then it became like this frantic, hectic schedule. But then for the month of November, I one-upped myself, because I wrote all of the November videos in October. All five of them were written before the month even began. And that was a whole new level. It wasn't just scheduling. It was a whole new level of this. I, I talked about this in a previous decompression chamber. And as a result, Davu had his work cut out for him all the way up until just recently. And, like, I wrote the, the like, because we pushed back the Shonen video that was supposed to come out in October, we pushed it back to December. So that one, um, yeah, we got all the November videos. We have the first December video done. I really only need three this month, and I'm going to do, like, a month-ending post on Patreon. So I already had the next one written back in October. And now I just need a third one for December. Basically, what I'm saying is that I got so far ahead of myself in November that I'm like, that I'm so, that like now I have, there was no rush. There was no rush to finish the December work in, in November. And there's still no rush to finish the December work even halfway through December because I was just that far ahead of myself. And that's given me time to do all these other projects, all these other weird little things, like this audiobook, like Handfuls of Zen. And it's kind of like, man, I'm, I'm fast enough and good enough at coming up with concepts and I have such a wealth of ideas that I could do this forever. Like, I can always be this far ahead of myself and I can always keep coming up with new things. And why that's so valuable, why I'm explaining that, is that that is the environment in which I can write a book or write fiction, or write, or make more music, or learn to draw finally. Like, those are all things that the reason I haven't done them is because I'm scared of them taking away from my career. I'm scared that if I can't work on my main series videos, then, then you know, that, that will deteriorate while I'm trying to work on this other shit. 
But if I can have, and this is what the, this is what I've been advertising on Patreon from the beginning. Like it always said, like the, the highest goals were always, if I make this much, I can do other things. You know, I can do bigger, crazier things. And if I can continue to do something like, you know, what if I get two months ahead of myself? You know, if I have two months worth of videos written before any of them come out, I can do whatever the fuck I want for two months. Two months is enough time for me to finish literally anything. You know, I wrote a novel in in a in a month before. I wrote the asterisk War sucks in a in a month and a half. You know, um, I could do I could do a novel in one month and polish it the next month. I could design, uh, you know, I could write something and then illustrate it the next month. You know, like something like that. I could do crazy bigger projects by getting so far ahead of myself and always having that, like that knowledge that I'm good enough to make that happen and. I don't think I would have been that good at any other time before. Like, this is how I know I'm improving. Because those five videos were all good. Like, if I tried to write five videos in, like, six days, which is how I did, if I tried to do that even at the start of this year, they would have all come out shit. I mean, if you look at the October thing, where I did the video a month, uh, a day all month in 2014, most of those videos are not worth going back to. There's, like, a small handful that are. But, like, most of them were just, like, little throwaway things that had nothing to do with anything that were just me trying to rush through the month. Um, if I did that today, I could, I mean, this is what I was trying to do at the time, that I wrote the, the five videos. I was gonna write a whole fucking, uh, 15 of them, I think. 15 or, th yeah, it was supposed to be 15. But I ended up writing the ones that I was the most interested in and then leaving the rest on hold. But, like, they all came out as fully-fledged videos that I was completely proud of. Not one of them do I think that I have anything negative to say about. I loved all five of those videos. They came out exactly how I envisioned, pretty much. So, um, that's something I can only do now. And I really feel like I'm reaching a point where I can do all these things creatively that I've been dreaming of for years now. Um, and so maybe you'll see the fruits of that in the near future. Um... This is a very upbeat podcast, probably, uh, compared to the last two. I think the the last one was me complaining about uh, not having, not getting laid, not having a girlfriend. Um, which, incidentally, I just, like, after that podcast, I just completely forgot about the online dating thing and went back to what I was doing, which is making videos and drinking constantly. And the week before that was the, the depression chamber. So th this is a pick me up this time. Y yeah, back in the back in the saddle, the good old fun Digi Bro saddle. You know, we're we're having a good time again. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope um, I hope you are not one of my friends who is currently creatively unfulfilled and is now stewing in bitter. Uh, anger over my success. <laughs> I hope you're having a good time. Thanks, uh, thanks for listening. Play us out, uh, jazz boys.